The other part of the skeletal system we need to explore are the joints. Your objectives for this segment are to be able to distinguish between the three structural and the three functional types of joints, list the kinds or shapes of joints, give examples of each, and describe the type of movement each performs, describe the parts of a synovial joint, distinguish between different types of arthritis, and describe homeostatic imbalances related to joints. Joints are frequently called articulations. Joints are simply a place where two or more bones meet so that the bones are held together and we have mobility of the skeleton. Joints are the weakest part of the skeletal system. You will dislocate a joint before you will break a bone. We can classify joints by function and by structure, so let's look at function first. Synarthroses are joints that are immovable. Their bones are so tightly held together that no movement is allowed. An amphiarthrosis has a slight amount of movement in the joint. And diarthroses are the freely movable joints. When we think about joints, it's usually diarthroses that we think about. Now this E makes all of these words plural. If you change the E to I, it's a singular, so it looks like a different word, but it's just how they do it in Latin. When we classify joints by structure, we also have three types of joints. Fibrous joints have the bones held together by fibrous tissue. Now, cartilaginous joints have the fibrous, or have the bones held together by fibrous cartilage, and synovial joints have the joints held together by a joint capsule. Sutures are one type of fibrous joints. Here the fibers are very dense and very short so that sutures are immovable joints or synarthroses. With a syndesmosis, the fibers that hold the bone, bones together are a little looser and there's usually a slight amount of movement, so these would be amphiarthroses. Cartilaginous joints are things like the vertebral discs or the cartilage that holds the two hip bones together in front, the pubic symphysis. Some of these are capable of slight movement, some are incapable of movement at all. But both the vertebral discs and the pubic symphysis are amphiarthroses. The synovial joints the, with the joint capsule have some space between the two bones, and this allows for free movement. So all synovial joints are diarthroses. So things like the elbow, the knee, the hip, the shoulder joint, those kinds of joints are all synovial joints and diarthroses. So here you see some different types of joints. You've got a cartilaginous joint that holds the first rib to the sternum. Here's another cartilaginous joint holding the vertebra together. Here's a cartilaginous joint holding the pubic symphysis together. The fibrous joints here are the sutures of the skull. Here is another fibrous joint between the tibia and the fibula. This has a uh, little longer fibers, so there's a little wiggle room there. And then all of these joints are synovial joints, where you've got some space between the bone and a joint capsule is holding the bones together. These bone, bones are all, joints are all freely movable or diarthroses. Fibrous joints and cartilaginous joints can either be synarthroses, where there's no movement, or amphiarthroses, where there's slight movement. Synovial joints have some distinct structures to them. First of all, the bones in the, involved in the joint have articular cartilage on the end. This makes the bone smooth and allows it to glide more freely across the two bones. The fibrous articular capsule holds the bones together. It's lined with a membrane called the synovial membrane, which secretes the synovial fluid. And the synovial fluid is a little bit of lubricating uh, material that's in the joint cavity, again reducing friction as the bones move across each other as they uh, bend and, and move like they should. And many of the joints have reinforcing ligaments. Ligaments, remember, hold bones together, and some of these are incorporated into the fibrous articular capsule. Some of them are outside or inside the capsule, but they help reinforce the capsule and strengthen the joint. 
So in this picture we see the articulating or articular cartilage here at the ends of the bones. You have your fibrous capsule lined with the synovial membrane. Here's the space between the bones. So there'll be a little bit of synovial fluid in there. The whole capsule, the whole articular capsule is both the fibrous capsule and the synovial membrane. And here you see some supporting ligaments. Some other joint structures that are not part of the joint but associated with the joint are bursa. Bursa are little synovial sacs that are filled with synovial fluid and they're found sort of between bones and between ligaments and bones and tendons and bones that act sort of as ball bearings so that joint movement is smooth. And then we have tendon sheaths which are sort of elongated bursa. They're again fluid filled sacs but they're longer and they're wrapped around tendons. Tendons hold muscle to bone and again, as the tendons need to move across a joint, it allows for a little less friction. It helps reduce the friction. And here's the shoulder joint. And here we see a tendon sheath wrapped around this tendon of the biceps muscle because this tendon has to come up and go all the way through here to articulate or to join back here. And so we've wrapped it in a tendon sheath so that it doesn't get too pinched up in here as the shoulder moves. And then here is a bursa, a little sac, that's between the uh, ligament that's holding the parts of the scapula together. And again, that just gives for a little more, uh, less restriction. And then we see the parts of the synovial joint, the articular cartilage, the synovial membrane, the joint cavity with the synovial fluid. Um, all of those structures are still there. There's the fibrous capsule. Here's the fibrous capsule up here coming down. Now there are different types of synovial joints. The shape of the articulating bones determine the movement of the joints. So however the bones fit together, that is what determines how, they, how much the joint can move. In a plane joint, the articular surfaces are pretty flat. So the only kind of movement we have is sort of a short slipping gliding movement. We call this non-axial movement because it's not particularly in either plane. And what you see here, we have this kind of articulation in the wrist bones themselves. Uh, these bones, you may think that you're bending your wrist, you're using these bones, but you're not. They're just kind of slip sliding on each other as you move your hand around. Then hinge joints have a cylindrical end that fit into a trough. So you've got this round thing that fits in. This is your elbow joint. And it allows for angular movement. That is, you can flex and extend. You can straighten that joint or you can bend that joint, but only in one plane. And this is what we have in the elbow. This is what we have in the ankle and in the fingers, in the knee. The pivot joint has a round end that fits into a ring. Now this again is in your elbow, but here's the radius attached to the ulna by this ring of, cartilage, of ligament here. And what happens is this allows the radius to rotate against the ulna. So this is the radio ulnar joint. And this is what allows you to pronate and supinate your hand. It allows you to flip your hand over. A condyloid joint has an egg-shaped structure that fits into kind of an oval concave place. And this is what we see here in the knuckles. You can get some side-to-side -side movement and some back-and-forth movement. So you can flex and extend and kind of make, describe a circle with that joint a little bit. So it will abduct and adduct as well as flex and extend. And your knuckle, what we call the meta uh, metcarpophalangeal joint between, because it's between the uh, metacarpals and the phalanges is this kind of joint. The um, saddle joint is kind of unique to higher primates. Uh, both ends have convex and concave areas so it fits like a rider in a saddle. That's where it gets its name. And you only have two of these joints, one in your right hand and one in your left hand. 
It allows for side to side and back and forth movement so you can flex, extend, abduct, and adduct. But what's so, uh, such a big deal about this joint is this is what allows for what we call your opposable thumb. And that means you can take your thumb and touch the tip of each of your four fingers. And you might not think this is a big deal, but try taping your thumb to your hand and doing almost anything. You can't pick up a glass or a cup or hold a pencil. This opposable thumb is a real big deal. The ball and socket joint is exactly like it sounds. There's a spherical end that fits into a round socket, a ball and socket joint. And this is the most freely movable joint of all. It moves on all the axes so you can abduct and adduct and flex and extend and rotate and circumduct. You can do all of the movements with this joint. And your ball and socket joints are your hip and your shoulder. Now some of the homeostatic imbalances include things like bursitis and tendonitis. And you know by now that itis means inflammation of. So this is inflammation of the bursa or the tendon sheaths. And typically this happens because you have overused a joint and you've irritated those areas. Treatment for this is usually anti-inflammatories and resting the joint. Sometimes people who type get tendonitis in their wrist and they wear the wrist braces until they kind of get over that. In a sprain, the ligaments and the tendons that help surround the joint are damaged because they're excessively stretched. Because ligaments and tendons do not have a good blood supply, this kind of damage is very slow to heal. And a dislocation is when the bone is forced out of its normal position. The, the jaw can do this. The jaw and the shoulder joints are the two weakest joints in your body and they're the most easily dislocated. Others can be dislocated, but these are the two most common. In order to treat this, you have to reduce the dislocation, that is pull everything back into alignment. Um, it's very painful to have a joint dislocation. It hurts to have the reduction, but once it's back in place, it amazingly quits hurting. Another problem with joints is arthritis. Now arthritis is some sort of inflammation or degenerative disease that damages the joints. Acute arthritis can strike at any age at any time. Chronic arthritis is long term. It's slow to come on, it's not as damaging, and it lasts a long time. It's very difficult to treat. Acute arthritis is usually caused by a bacterial infection of the joint. The synovial membrane thickens, you produce extra synovial fluid, the joint swells up. Because it is bacterial, it can be treated with antibiotics and typically that takes care of it. Your chronic arthritis are osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gouty arthritis. Now, osteoarthritis is the arthritis of aging. It's a degenerative arthritis, usually referred to as wear and tear arthritis. Uh, basically, you use your joints, use your joints, use your joints. You start to kind of grind away the articular cartilage. Uh, as a result, you start getting some bone spurs around the edges of that articular cartilage and they kind of impede joint movement because when you go to bend the joint, there's a little bone spur that stops you and causes some pain. Um, you also start getting this crunchy noise in your joints. People sometimes say, my joints creak, and if you listen, you can hear them creaking, and that is crepitus, and that's because the cartilage is just, it's not smooth anymore, and when it grinds on, the two cartilages grind together, you get that kind of crunchy noise because they're not smooth. Uh, the areas of the body that are most subject to osteoarthritis are areas you move a lot, your fingers, your cervical and lumbar spine, your knees, and your hips. Now, your fingers and your cervical spine you use a lot. Your lumbar spine, your knees, and your hips take a lot of stress bearing the weight of your body. People who carry around a lot of extra weight accelerate osteoarthritis in the lumbar spine, knees, and hips. Osteoarthritis is rarely crippling, but it is painful. Uh, again, about all you can do is take anti-inflammatories because there's not much else you can do. The other thing you can do is try to maintain a healthy weight and use your joints kindly. 
Rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory disorder. We believe it's an autoimmune disease. Now typically we see it sometime between age 40 and age 50, which is standard for autoimmune diseases, but this can happen at any age. There have actually been small children with rheumatoid arthritis. Because it is an autoimmune disease, it's seen three times more frequently in women than in men, and that's typical for autoimmune diseases in general. What happens is the body starts thinking the synovial membrane has, is foreign to it, and it starts attacking it. And as a result, the synovial membrane thickens, and you get a panis, that is the synovial membrane starts to cling to the articular cartilage. And then the cartilage is destroyed, and instead of replacing with cartilage, you replace it with scar tissue. And that scar tissue ossifies. Now since the scar tissue is between the two ends of the bones, when you start getting that ossification of the scar tissue, the joints fuse, and this is when the joint becomes non-functional. So this is the crippling type of arthritis. Um, it also will distort the joints. And here you see where these are the joints of the hand between the metacarpals and the phalanges and how they've been damaged. And you now have this fusion of the joints and you really can't close the hand into a fist anymore. Osteoarthritis tends to be worse on one side of the body than the other because it's a, a use kind of issue and you usually are harder on one side of your body than the other. But rheumatoid arthritis is pretty bilateral. If you've got it in one hand, you have it to the same degree in the other hand. Gouty arthritis is more common in men and is seen typically after they turn 40. Gout is the result of uric acid accumulating in the blood. Now uric acid is a breakdown product of one of the amino acids of proteins and in some people they just don't metabolize this appropriately. The uric acid forms crystals that are placed in the soft tissues of the joint and these crystals have sharp little edges on them so when you move the joint these crystals cause considerable amount of pain. For some reason, the joint of the big toe is a very common spot for these crystals to be deposited, but it can be deposited in other areas. Now, you don't realize it until your big toe is damaged that your big toe gives you most of your balance and stability when you walk. So when you have that joint inflamed, it's very, very painful to walk. We're not sure what causes gouty arthritis to occur in some people. Uh, if you don't treat it, the bones can fuse. There may be a genetic predisposition. In other words, it may run in families, but we haven't found a gene for gout. It's recommended that if people have gouty arthritis, they lose weight to reduce the stress on the joint, and they avoid alcohol and certain foods, foods like uh, seafood uh, and other certain meats that are rich in the particular amino acid that breaks down to uric acid. There are several drugs that can be used to treat it. They help dissolve the, the gouty crystals in the uh, joint. All right, let's do a little check here. Reinforcing ligaments are found associated with which type of joint? Cartilaginous, synovial, fibrous, or all of the above? All right, remember synovial joints are the only ones that need reinforcing ligaments. The arthritis typically seen in old age as a result of wear and tear on the joints is bacterial, rheumatoid, osteoarthritis, or gouty arthritis. It's osteoarthritis. All of us will have osteoarthritis if we live long enough. The others, not necessarily.